All right. Uh, <clears throat> hope everybody is uh, ready to go. Um, we just looked at a brief overview of the uh, different positions, the history, if you will, of the doctrine of baptism. And, uh, and now what we want to do in this second lecture is we want to look at the idea of baptism as uh, new creation. Now, for some reason, I'm not quite sure why, in terms of the psychological uh, motivations, or even perhaps the, uh, the theological motivations, it's uh, the idea that historically the church has struggled with accepting, using, and receiving the Old Testament. Uh, this is something that has not been necessarily just a problem in our own day and age. I mean, I can remember uh, as a child growing up within the church that I probably heard New Testament messages uh, much more frequently than I ever did Old Testament messages. Um, I don't know what the particular uh, ratio would be, but I suspect it would be three or perhaps four, maybe even five to one. Maybe some of you would even have a higher ratio than that. In the earliest days of the church, there was a, a theologian by the name of uh, Martian, um, and, uh, or Marcion, and Martian uh, denied the authority of the Old Testament. He purged his entire Bible you know, of the Old Testament. And he retained ten of Paul's letters uh, and uh, rejected the pastoral epistles, for example. And he operated with a, a, a shortened version of Luke's Gospel. Because obviously, as you know, you read the Gospels, there are multiple references to the Old Testament in the Gospel. So if you're doing a cut and paste job, well then you really have to uh, cut out a lot even from the Gospels. In the 19th century, you had similar trends, for example, with the father of liberal theology, a theologian by the name of Frederick Schleiermacher. Uh, you look in his uh, massive oh, six, 700 page uh, Christian faith, which that's the title of his systematic theology, and uh, um, he says that the Old Testament should be bound with the New Testament as an appendix. It's something kind of that's really not necessary. If you kind of have some interest, well, then you can look at it, but that it's not necessary. He even argued that the Old Testament is sub-Christian. I think one of, uh, perhaps one of the motivating factors behind this is the uh, misperception that uh, in the Old Testament you have the angry God and uh, who demands all of these blood sacrifices, Whereas in the New Testament, you have Jesus, and he's, he's kind, and he's loving, and he's you know, warm and fluffy. Um, you know, and according to our own perception, he looks like one of the Almond brothers, so certainly he must, um, you know, he must be nice, right? Instead of this fiery chariot you know, throwing lightning bolts from heaven. Um, and for you youngsters, if you don't know about the Almond brothers, Google it. I'm sure you'll find pictures. Uh, anyway, um, you have similar trends in dispensationalism. Dispensationalism, or what we know as the Left Behind books, so the, the theology that stands behind the Left Behind series, uh, is that uh, they would argue, for example, that uh, there are at least classical dispensationalism would say that there's two ways of salvation. Uh, there's salvation in the Old Testament, and then that, that's largely by works and sacrifices, whereas then there's salvation in the New Testament, that's by faith. Um, you know, so, um, yeah, you look at, for example, a, uh, uh, in, in a theological book, say, written by Charles Ryrie. Charles Ryrie, famous dispensational theologian. His book titled Basic Theology, and he has um, the scriptural index in the back of his book, and the references are seven to one. Seven New Testament references for every one New Old Testament reference. Um, and so... Um, uh, that's in his key doctrine section, and then in his general index, it's three to one. You know, so for every New Testament reference, there's only three references, there's only one Old Testament reference. Uh, the, the same trend especially applies when we're talking about the doctrine of baptism. In his book uh, written on the doctrine of baptism, it's a theologian, French theologian by the name of Pierre Marcel, and he was talking about Karl Barth's doctrine of baptism in his book on baptism. He says, it's as if for Barth, the doctrine of the, or the Old Testament matters for nothing. And that in the entire book, there was one reference, one reference to the Old Testament. 
Now in Bart's defense, it was a short book. It's only about 100 pages. But still, to, to have 100 pages and only have one Old Testament reference does show you where the, you think the weight of the doctrine lies. But when we look at the uh, scriptures, and particularly in trying to formulate our doctrine, it's so important that we look at the Old Testament as well. And I'd almost be willing to say that we should perhaps invert the, 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 the ratio of references, that for every one New Testament reference, we should probably have three to four Old Testament references. Now in practice, I'm not sure if this always works out, but that's perhaps the goal that we should look for, because if we look at it this way, I tell my students this, and I tell, tell the people in my church this, that everything that goes on in the New Testament has grown out of the Old Testament. When Jesus, for example, <clears throat> heals the lepers, and he, does, he touches them, well, to you and me, that may not seem like much. I think all of, we, we think of it in terms of disease, sickness, and germs. We're like, oh, gross, I don't want to touch you know, the, the leper because I'm, I might get leprosy myself. But you have to read that against the book of Leviticus and the backdrop of Leviticus to know that a leper was considered unclean, was unholy. They should be cast outside the camp. They were not allowed to be in the midst of God's people, and all you had to do is touch the leper, and you would contract that unholy defilement, and you too would be cast outside the camp. In other words, you would be excommunicated. So it was unthinkable for Jesus to touch the leper. And rather than to contract defilement, he conveyed healing and holiness. All of a sudden, you get a very thick account. One of my colleagues at the seminary uses the adjectives thick and thin to describe things. And I think it's such a valuable way to describe it. If you just read the New Testament apart from the Old, well, you can get a thin account of what's going on. But if you want a much thicker account, or to put it in more technological terms, if you want a three-dimensional versus a two-dimensional uh, picture of something, uh, then you really need the Old Testament. Think, for example, of uh, uh, Christ. I think for many people, Christ is simply Jesus' last name. Jesus Christ. Well, what else would we call him? That's right. But when we recognize that Christ is an Old Testament term, and if I, I love to use this analogy, uh, is that it, imagine it's a, it's, a, it's a freight train, and it's pulling freight cars behind it, and if the, if the train engine is Christ, it has got a, a really long train of freight cars that it's pulling behind it. I mean, it's as if... And maybe I've used this illustration before. If I, if I have, please forgive me. But imagine if I were to decide to go into politics. I just really wouldn't want to do that. But let's just pretend for the sake of, of um, a discussion that I was going to go into politics. And I wanted to make a splash. And I were to put on a um, uh, 18th century blue coat with gold uh, trim, a tricorn, a white powdered wig, and I were to get an axe and go over to a cherry tree and chop it down, who would you think that I'm trying to uh, ev evoke memories of? George Washington. Now, I don't know about school now, but I mean, when I was in school, they talked about the George Washington and the chopping down of the cherry business. In other words, there are certain terms, certain ideas, certain words that if I just invoke them, all of a sudden an entire th world of meaning comes along with it. So much so that you don't have to give much context because those words bring all of this freight with it. Well, that's the nature of the word Christ. Because it's the anointed. All of a sudden you're thinking Psalm 2, Psalm 110. You're thinking of the Melchizedek priesthood. Uh, you're thinking of Psalm 89 and the anointed of David. I mean, there's just all of these ideas uh, that come uh, into the forefront. Well, that's the nature of baptism. I think a lot of people don't even realize, for example, that New Testament translators, and it kind of bothers me that they do this, but I guess, I don't know, maybe they have to, um, they punt on the term baptism. They don't translate the term. They just bring it straight over from the Greek. 
you know, most Greek terms get translated. Um, where it's, it's as if I were to say sacrament. What's the Latin term for sacrament? Sacramentum. There's no difference hardly, just a couple of extra letters. What's the Greek term? Does anybody know the Greek term for baptism? Baptizo. <laughs> There's virtually no difference there. It's because the New Testament translators aren't quite sure what it means. And Now, tons of people will tell you what it means, but it's so much so that they just bring the term straight over. Does it mean immersion? Does it mean sprinkling? Does it mean pouring? Is it literal? Is it metaphorical? All right, so it's important that we, we, we connect this. And so when we look at the Old Testament and look at baptism in the light of the Old Testament, uh, we are going to find uh, that there is a whole entire world of ideas associated with this term. And that if you were to invoke this term, it would bring a whole lot of freight with it. Okay, just like the word Christ, for example. And so one of the chief ideas that we find associated with the term baptism, or the ideas surrounding baptism, is that of new creation. New creation. And I want you to keep that in the forefront of your mind. And so we're going to explore in the Old Testament ideas of new creation and baptism. Or, if we get very specific, we want to look at the ideas of water and spirit. Water and spirit. Nowadays, if you want to do a search of your Bible, you can, get an, you can look online. Uh, you have all sorts of computer Bibles. If you have access to one of these, then what I would encourage you to do is do a search on water and spirit and see how many times those two terms are used in the same sentence. And I think it will surprise you as to how frequently the two come up together. Because what this does by looking at these two terms is it shows us that baptism first shows up not in the first century, but all the way in Genesis 1.1. If you read a number of books on baptism, for example, they'll say, well, where did baptism come from? Well, we know that John the Baptist was one of the first people to do it. But where did John get it from? Well, John probably got it from the Dead Sea Scrolls community. Okay? Uh, what is the Dead Sea Scrolls community? There was a group of people who kind of removed themselves from the, the population centers and lived by the Dead Sea. And... Uh, they had copies of the scriptures, and they kind of became something of a, of a distinct cult. And so they think that, well, they're the ones that started these water-washing rituals. The way you get into our community is if we clean you first. And it's not just a bath, but rather it's a ceremonial cleansing. Okay? So they think, well, John the Baptist probably interacted with them. And that's where he got it from. Other people say, well, no, not the Dead Sea Scrolls community. Uh, you know, think, for example, everybody remembers, the, well, maybe not everybody, but do you remember the Branch Davidians? You know, they were off in Waco, Texas. Well, people were kind of vaguely familiar with them, but that doesn't necessarily mean that just because you lived in Waco, Texas, that you knew everything that they were doing. And so just because you were near the Dead Sea Scroll community doesn't necessarily mean that you knew what this community was doing. So they say, no, there's another source for that, um, in that uh, John the Baptist and the Christian church picked it up from the Jewish communities. Because it was the Jewish community around them that instituted this new practice that if a Gentile wanted to become a Jew, he would not only have to be circumcised, but then he would have to be baptized. So that's where they got it from. Now, uh, the evidence is, I think, is slim for that. Uh, and in fact, there's a stronger case to be made that the first century Jews picked up the practice of baptism and water cleansing from the Christian church. But that's neither here nor there. We don't want to get embroiled in those types of discussions. Rather, I want to say that the first place that we want to turn is the book of Genesis. And we find this when we look at the New Testament. And you can turn there if you like. It's to 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3 where the apostle is talking and he makes mention of baptism. And he says this in 1 Peter chapter 3, beginning in verse 18. 1 Peter chapter 3, beginning in verse 18. 
For Christ suffered also once for our sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison, because they formerly did not obey. When God's patience waited in the days of Noah, let's stop there for a second. Notice that Peter is talking about Christ, and now he's appealing to the book of Genesis. He's appealing to Noah. While the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through water. So he's appealing now to Noah, the ark, and the flood, and the fact that Noah's family was brought safely through the water, or was saved, if you will, through the water. He says in verse 21, baptism, which corresponds to this, that's the English Standard Version translation, uh, I prefer this translation, I think it's the New American Standard, somebody can double check me on that, but it says there is also an antitype which now saves us. Baptism, the removal of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience towards God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. When it says here in the ESV, baptism, which corresponds to this, the underlying Greek term says that baptism, and that it invokes the term, is an antitype. Now, what is an antitype? Um, in technical terms, there are types and antitypes. An antitype is a person, I'm sorry, a type is a person, place, or thing that prefigures or foreshadows a New Testament person, place, or thing. A type foreshadows the antitype. Very broadly, Moses prefigures Jesus. Moses kind of does things like Jesus would eventually do. Um, the redemption from Egypt, the Exodus, is a foreshadow, or it prefigures our redemption from Satan, sin, and death. I'll use an illustration to kind of make sure you understand this concept, is that um, when I was a child, um, I have no idea how this happened. And my parents generally make uh, you know, very good parenting decisions. Um, and I, if mom and dad, if you're watching right now, well then, you know, sorry. Uh, but uh, I think I was six or seven, and uh, we decided to go to a movie uh, as a family, and somehow we ended up in Jaws. <laughs> um, I was terrified. <laughs> I mean, I was just. What was funny though is that we somehow walked into it towards the the the, the height of the movie when the shark is just chowing down on the boat, right? And I just, you know, and I was like, I want to get out of here. And my brother, who's like five, he's like, this is great. <laughs> I want to see more. Um, my parents quickly took us out of there. We ended up seeing Bambi, a uh, big difference. <laughs> you know, going from one extreme to the other. <clears throat> um, but in Jaws, when I would later visit that movie again, um, how do you know that the shark is coming? That music. I bet you, if you went to a beach with a loudspeaker and started playing <laughs> just that music, nobody would go in the water. Dun, 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 dun. You know, I mean, that music foreshadows, it signals that the fish is coming. Right? that something bad is going to happen. Well, that's kind of the nature of the relationship between the type and the anti-type in the scriptures. The type foreshadows, it signals, it tells you that this is what the real thing is going to be like. Notice here, what Peter says is he connects baptism with the flood. So it's not the Dead Sea Scrolls community. It's not the first century Jewish practice. It's in the Old Testament. It's in the book of Genesis. And in particular, when we think about the flood itself, 
the flood was a recreation act of God. He, in a sense, took the creation, wiped the slate clean, and created it over again. He put all of the creatures, uh, you know, two by two in the ark with Noah and his family, and he started over again. It's a, it's a, it's a sense in, there's a sense in which Noah was another Adam. Noah was another Adam. But in particular, there are some very specific details in the Old Testament text there of the flood account that draw us back even further. In that in um, Genesis 8.1, in Genesis 8.1 we read that God sent a wind to push back the waters. The Hebrew term there is a ruach, Elohim. The, the term for wind in the Old Testament is ruach. I'm not just trying to show off, <laughs> just because we're giving you the, I'm giving you the Hebrew. It's important because that phrase, ruach Elohim, in Genesis 8:1, the, the wind of God, ruach can also be translated as spirit. And the first place that the Ruach Elohim shows up is in Genesis 1-2. The Spirit of God was over the waters. So that if you were reading Genesis 8-1 and you heard the Ruach Elohim was over the waters, you would immediately be drawn back to the initial creation account, which would make you think this flood is a recreation of, of the earth. And it would draw you back to Genesis 1. Now Genesis 1, we find the Spirit of God doing what over the creation? Hovering. Now I wish there was a better word. I would prefer fluttering. Why fluttering? Well, because hovering gives the impression of a helicopter. I mean, that's another word in our, own, in our own context that has certain connotations. And we think of, you know, just kind of hovering. And that's not exactly what birds do. Birds don't quite hover. I've seen birds sometimes where the wind gets going and they kind of spread out and they just kind of sit there. But it's another thing to hover versus fluttering. Now, what's inter interesting about the Hebrew term uh, that's used here in Genesis 1-2 that we get translated as hovering is that it occurs only two times in the whole of the uh, Old Testament. In Genesis 1-2 and in Deuteronomy 32-11. And in Deuteronomy 32-11, the Lord says to Israel, when you were in the wilderness, I hovered over you like a bird stirs up its nest. So here we have, that's why I prefer fluttering. Here we have the Spirit of God fluttering over the waters of creation. What happens from beneath these waters? The creation emerges, the waters subside. In Genesis 8, we have the waters of the flood, and they are over the creation. And there's a Ruach Elohim pushes back the waters. But before the waters go back, what does Noah release over the waters? Releases a couple of birds. Releases a raven. The raven doesn't come back. Releases a dove. One dove doesn't come back. The next dove comes back and brings an olive branch. So here you have a bird flying over the waters of the flood. And Peter says that the flood is a type of baptism. So that what's going on with the flood is telling us that there's something going on that points us to baptism. All right, so let's shift gears a little bit, and we're going to come back to those images in a little bit. Uh, but I want us to turn over to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 
want us to see what the Apostle Paul has to say here. And listen carefully. He says in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 1 and following, For I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that our fathers were all under the cloud, and all passed through the sea, and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea, and all ate the same spiritual food, and all drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them, and the rock was Christ. Now notice here that Paul is reflecting back upon the Exodus, this Old Testament event. Notice he's going back to the Old Testament again. This is why I think that it's so urgent and important that when we're talking about baptism, that we look at the Old Testament because when these terms are invoked, that's where the writers of the New Testament are going. Peter goes to the flood. Paul now is going here to the Old Testament. And notice particular, he says that they were baptized into Moses and in the cloud and in the sea. What is the cloud? Now, I don't have time to expand upon this in great detail, uh, but the cloud, I think, is the presence of God. And in particular, the presence of the Spirit of God. Because here, for example, in Exodus chapter 14, verse 19, they're led by the angel and the cloud. The cloud was a pillar of fire by night and a cloud by day. Both the cloud and the pillar of fire are identified with the presence of God according to Leviticus 16.2. I think that the fact that they're led by the angel, I think the angel is identified with the Lord. You see this in Exodus chapter 3, I think. And I even think that there's corroboration from the book of Jude. The book of Jude says this in Jude chapter 5. Now, not all of your Bibles will probably say this because there's a textual variation there. Some say the Lord, some say Jesus. But Jude verse 5 says, Now I want to remind you, although you once fully knew it, that Jesus, who saved a people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed those who did not believe. Now what's interesting about that is that New Testament scholars will say, uh, when it comes to textual criticism, how do you decide which reading of a verse is accurate? And there's a rule. The more difficult reading is usually the accurate reading. Because people have a tendency to want to try to change things that, try, that don't make sense. So there's some manuscripts that say the Lord. That's an easily understood statement. But there are multiple manuscripts that say Jesus. That's the more difficult one to understand. Well, how could Jesus possibly be present in the Old Testament? Well, he's there. <laughs> You know, we don't have to, you know, I, I don't have the time to, to verify this in numerous passages of Scripture, but when you think, for example, when Joshua encounters the, the captain of the guard uh, and he worships him, that I think is the pre incarnate Christ. In John chapter 12, verse 41, uh, John says that Jesus, uh, that, uh, that uh, Isaiah saw him, saw Jesus. And I think he's referring to Isaiah chapter 6, so that Isaiah 6 is a, is a pre incarnate Christ. Uh, so that the more difficult reading here is that Jesus saved a people. So certainly we can identify the, the presence of God with Jesus as the angel of the Lord, the messenger of the Lord, but the Holy Spirit is also present at the Exodus. Uh, if you turn over, and you don't have to if you don't want to, but in Haggai, in the, uh, in the prophet Haggai, Haggai chapter 2, Haggai chapter 2 and verses 4 and following. Yet now be strong, O Zerubbabel, declares the Lord. Be strong, O Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest. Be strong, all you people of the land, declares the Lord. For I am with you, declares the Lord of hosts. According to the covenant I made with you when you came out of Egypt, my spirit remains in your midst. Fear not. So here, the prophet places the spirit at the exodus. Notice you have Paul calling the Exodus, the Red Sea crossing, a baptism, and the prophet Haggai places the spirit at this baptism. 
turn over to one other passage of Scripture, to uh, Isaiah chapter 63. Isaiah chapter 63, verses 11 and following. Uh, Let me go back to verse 10. But they rebelled and grieved his Holy Spirit. Therefore he turned to be their enemy and himself fought against them. Then he remembered the days of old, of Moses with his people. Isaiah 63, verses 11 and following. Where is he who brought them up out of the sea with the shepherds of his flock? Where is he who put in the midst of them his Holy Spirit? who caused his glorious arm to go at the right hand of Moses, who divided the waters before them to make for himself an everlasting name, who led them through the depths. Like a horse in the desert, they did not stumble. Like livestock that go down into the valley, the Spirit of the Lord gave them rest. So you led your people to make for yourself a glorious name. The prophet Isaiah is describing the exodus that Paul calls a baptism, and he places the Holy Spirit as the one who is dividing the waters before them. Okay? So the presence of the water uh, and the Spirit. So notice here that we have three chief events. You have the creation that emerges from the water with the Holy Spirit hovering or fluttering over the waters like a bird. You have the flood uh, that um, Peter identifies as a type of baptism. And you have Noah as he's being saved through these waters, and he releases a dove out over those waters. You have Israel who passes through the Red Sea that Paul calls a baptism, that the prophets Haggai and Isaiah place the Spirit present at this baptism. And then remember Deuteronomy 32.11, where the Lord says that I hovered over you as a bird tending its young. The presence of the Spirit, bird imagery, and baptism associated with all three of these. Now, you hear that story repeated multiple times. All of a sudden, when you come to the baptism of Jesus, everything should sound very, very familiar to you. You have Jesus, the Son of God. Adam was God's son. Israel is called God's son. Jesus comes out of the water. Who descends upon him? Holy Spirit, in the form of a dove. So it's like, you know, that's why I say that you can read the baptism account of Jesus, you can understand what's going on, but if you want a thicker account of what's going on, you have to read it against this backdrop here. And so the idea here is that Genesis 1-1 is an account of the creation, this new creation that God is bringing forth. Genesis 6-9 through is an account of God's recreation of the earth that he does through his spirit, with water. With the Exodus, this is Paul describing it as a baptism, and this is the creation, if you will, of Israel as a nation, their birth from the waters that is is, is, uh, superintended by the work of the spirit. And then you have Jesus, who we would call the cornerstone of the new creation, who in his baptism is anointed with the Spirit, who descends upon him like a dove, and he begins to usher in the new heavens and the new earth. So that we have ideas of new creation associated with any time you see the combination and the imagery of water and spirit. When we look at the rest of the New Testament, and we're going to do this relatively quickly, I'm hoping that a number of passages and a number of uh, ideas that we find all of a sudden against this broader backdrop make a lot more sense. When Christ was speaking to Nicodemus, and he says, you cannot see the kingdom of God unless what? Unless you're born again, and in particular... Notice what he says in John chapter 3, 
John chapter 3, verse 5. Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Now you read the literature on this and there's all kinds of stuff. Well, maybe he means baptism. Maybe he means the amniotic fluid uh, in the birth process. That's kind of like water. I want to say, I've been present at the birth of my children. That's not water. <laughs> you know? um, maybe he means something, you know, what is he? I think that read against this backdrop that he's saying that it's a supernatural work of the Spirit that has to occur in order for you to be born again. This is not something that lies within you and that Jesus is ultimately referring to the work of the Spirit that is performed in conjunction with water. Okay. Um, remember that when John the, the, John the Baptist, or as I like to call him, John the Presbyterian, um, is performing, right? I mean, we all know that's right. You know. um, when he's performing baptism, he says, I baptize you with water, but he who comes after me will baptize you with what? Spirit. And in fact, in the Gospel of John, in John chapter 4, John goes out of his way in, verse, in chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. Notice what he says here. Now, when Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, parenthesis, although Jesus himself did not baptize, but only his disciples. Why would, they, why would, why would John bracket out the fact that Jesus wasn't baptizing with water? Why? He's not going to be baptizing with water. He's going to be baptizing with the Holy Spirit. Okay, so this is an important element here. Um, you see, for example, that I think we see the, the connections of this in John chapter 20, John chapter 20, verse 22, when Jesus appears in the upper room and he breathes out upon them. Look at John chapter 20 very quickly. I know this is probably starting to feel like a children's sword drill. You know, quick. Uh, but John chapter 20, verses 22. And when he had said this, he's in the upper room with them. Um, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. But Jesus breathes on them and says, receive the Holy Spirit. I think he's prophesying there to them, saying that I'm going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit. I'm going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit. And in fact here, even this breathing upon the Holy Spirit is invoking ideas of new creation. Who was breathed upon and came to life. Adam. He was created, formed out of the, the, the dust of the earth, and then whew, God exhales and breathes life into him. You see the same thing uh, when the wind comes along with Ezekiel's valley of dry bones. All of a sudden in Ezekiel 37, the bones start rattling and they come together and Israel is resurrected. So I think you see those ideas of cr new creation associated with them. But in particular, turn over to the book of Acts. Turn over to the book of Acts. And that here we know in the book of Acts that all of a sudden some strange things started happening. And a lot of people, they started speaking in tongues. Um, very briefly, it's the reversal of the curse of Babel where everybody was speaking different languages, but now, though they're speaking different languages, they're all saying the same thing. And notice what Peter says. But Peter, chapter 2, verse 14, But Peter, standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed him, Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give ear to my words. For these people are not drunk, as you suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day. But this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. And in the last days it shall, it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my Spirit on all flesh. What did John the Baptist say? I baptize you with water, but he who comes after me, whose sandal I'm not worthy to untie, he will baptize you with the Spirit. 
So this is what's happening. Jesus is pouring out the Spirit upon the church. Brief footnote. He's not immersing them. He's pouring out. Okay? And yet, he's, John said Jesus was going to baptize. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm not against immersion. We'll see later on that I think you can baptize by immersion. But notice the biblical imagery there. I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. Even on my male servants and female servants. In those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. Okay? So notice here that he connects these events, the events of Pentecost, with the outpouring of the spirit, or I want to say the baptism of the spirit. But in particular, look here at verse 30. Um... Being therefore a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants on his throne, he foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of Christ, that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God raised up, and of that we are all witnesses. Being therefore exalted at the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, He, Jesus, has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. So here Peter says, Jesus is at the right hand of the Father and he's pouring out the Spirit, just as he was promised. This, according to John the Baptist, is the baptism that was was the long-awaited for baptism. This is the baptism that Joel prophesied about, the outpouring of the Spirit. Now, as we'll get into this later on, why is baptism connected uh, with the flood? We'll see this in the next lecture. Is that because Jesus pours out the Spirit, but it's not just upon the church that the Spirit is poured out upon, but it's upon the entire creation. Because he is pouring out the Spirit upon the entire creation to recreate it. To bring about the new heavens and the new earth but it's especially upon the church. And so that with baptism, yes, it's about the cleansing from sin, but it's not just the cleansing from sin. Remember the question that we asked earlier, what is God saying through baptism? God is saying through baptism that Jesus has poured out the Spirit upon the church. So it's not just, if I can put it this crassly, when the person that is being baptized, it's not just the person getting wet, that is the beneficiary of that baptism. When you, the church, sits there and you see that pouring out of water upon that person, you have preached to your senses, your other senses, your sight in conjunction with the preaching of the word, that Christ has poured out the Spirit upon the entire church. And he is doing so to bring about a new creation, the new heavens, and the new earth. Very quickly, um, we see this, I think, in the Apostle Paul. Romans chapter 6. And then I told you that, at least very briefly in the introductory lecture, that certainly there were ideas of judgment connected to baptism, but there's certainly new life, new creation. What shall we say, Romans 6, 1? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead, the glory of the Father, we too might walk in the newness of life. Notice the newness of life is associated with baptism. The putting to death of the old man and the raising to life of the new. New creation is associated with baptism. Very quickly, very briefly. A lot of uh, Baptists will appeal to this verse and say, see, we're buried with Christ, therefore you have to be immersed in the water. And I want to say, not quite. I'm not so convinced of that line of argumentation. Because Jesus was buried... Where was he buried? In a tomb, above ground. He wasn't buried in the dirt. So that, that, that imagery quite doesn't work. Rather, I think it's more so in the, we can associate the images here in this sense, and we'll get to this, 
uh, in, in, in greater detail in the next lecture period, but it's, we're buried in the waters of judgment, of drowning. I think the imagery of burial there is not so much, don't think of burial in the ground, think of burial in terms of burial at sea. You're immersed into the waters and drown in judgment. And then when you emerge from the waters, just like the new creation, just like Adam coming out of the waters in the new creation, just like Noah and his family in the new creation coming up out of the waters, just like Israel coming up out of the waters in the new creation, you emerge as a new creature connected to the cornerstone of the new creation, Jesus Christ himself. One last passage is, a second, or I'm sorry, is Titus. Titus chapter 3. Titus chapter 3, I can find it. Hey, with these thin pages in the Bible, you flip a little bit, and all of a sudden you've gone through four books of the Bible. Um, my fat fingers can't handle that. See, I have fat fingers. I told my mom one time when I was taking piano lessons, I was like, these are not piano players' fingers. Those are fat and chubby. I can't reach all the keys. Um, Notice in Titus chapter 3, beginning in verse 4, But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, He saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to His own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and the renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom He poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior. Notice here, pouring, spirit, and water baptismal ideas. But the thing here is that I wouldn't want to appeal to this verse in terms of regeneration, thinking of the change that occurs within us, as tempting as that connection may be, and as commonly as you find that. This is a rare word in the New Testament. It occurs here only, and then in Matthew 19, 28, where Jesus says, in the regeneration, you will sit on 12 thrones ruling with me. I think that's the idea that needs to be brought in here, not the idea of the personal transformation of the individual. Rather, uh, think of it this way, if I translate, instead of regeneration, if I say, in the new heavens and the new earth, you will sit with me and rule on 12 thrones. In other words, the regeneration there is a reference not to the personal transformation, but to new creation. So he says here, but when the goodness and the loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, he saved us not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of new creation and the renewal of the Holy Spirit. Once again, new creation and Holy Spirit. And in fact, it's, uh, it's, a, it's not a canonical book of the Bible, but there is an epistle written by Clement. The first epistle of Clement. Um, which, if memory serves me correctly, he wrote it to the Corinthians. Um, so in a sense in which, there's a sense in which it's 3 Corinthians. If you want to know what happens, imagine it's the straight-to-DVD release sequel to uh, 2 Corinthians. Not as good as the originals, to, but it's close enough and that you're like, oh, I do want to see what happens. Um, Clement talks about Noah preaching regeneration. And Clement connects this term, regeneration, with the flood, which Peter connects with baptism. So it's not just the personal individual that is being spoken of here, but it's rather, it's an entirely bigger work of the new creation, the new heavens and the new earth. So now, very quickly to summarize all of this, is that we can talk about baptism preaching a message. This is a theme that we're hopefully going to tie up nice and neatly with a bow in the fourth lecture. But just as the gospel audibly preaches the the, the new creation to us because Christ comes and he raises us from death to life, plants, uh, uh, you know, places us a heart of flesh and removes our heart of stone and unites us to him, uh, he who is the last Adam, the, the cornerstone of the new heavens and the new earth. Baptism preaches to our senses visibly and tactily because we can feel the water, 
when we're being baptized is that it preaches to us that Christ has poured out the waters of new creation upon us. That this water is pointing to the work of the Spirit, to the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And keep in mind though here, and this is in rejection to Roman Catholic views, nowhere, I think, do we find the Scriptures connecting salvation with the water itself. Who is it that is ultimately bringing about the new creation? Not Jesus. Holy Spirit, this time the Sunday school answer was wrong. Um, as counterintuitive as that may seem. Although you could say Jesus is pouring out the Spirit, so Jesus is involved. But it's the Spirit who is bringing about this work. It's the Spirit who is bringing about this work. So hopefully we can have now, we have a, a, a slightly thicker understanding that when we are watching somebody be baptized, we are having preached to us the idea that Jesus has poured out the Spirit. The new creation is here. He is bringing about the new heavens and the new earth. And it's not just about the individual. but Rather, it's about the new creation. It's about the whole body of people upon whom the Spirit has been poured out, invoking the words of the prophecy of Joel. Upon your young men, your old men, your daughters, your sons. The Spirit has been poured out liberally upon the church. Okay? Now, in the next lecture period, we're going to see that baptism does not have just positive imagery connected to it, but as I alluded to here in this lecture and the lecture before, that there are also ideas of judgment associated with it. In the next lecture period, we want, to associate, or we want to connect this imagery of judgment, covenant judgment, to baptism, because there's some important elements here that are often not, uh, not observed and not accounted for. If you have questions, uh, write them down, and I'll do my best to get to them uh, when we hit the question and answer period. So uh, that concludes this one, and uh, we'll pick up with the next one in a few minutes.